Okay, so hi everybody, welcome back. Um, I hope you were able to take a little break there. So this session is going to go until um, uh, probably about 255 or 250 or so. And then we will um, take a short break and then head into the second session. So uh, as I said before, this is this session is about the ignition delays and uh, flame speeds. And um, Chris and Dan, I guess we uh, we didn't really talk about this. How do you guys want to handle presenting this? I think uh, Dan and I had a quick discussion offline. I guess I have okay. the notebooks up and ready to go and I right. can just run through them. And then I guess if people have questions, maybe as we're going along, we can try to answer them in the chat like we did with the main session. Sure. Yep. Um, yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat then and uh, and I'll jump in if anything strikes me. Yeah, um, I'll preface this. I'm not a strictly speaking a combustion chemist. So I think um, maybe Brian might be more qualified to answer some science related questions, but we'll do the best we can here. Um, all right. Uh, I think I need you to enable screen sharing. Okay, cool. Looks like I can now. Okay, so I think the first one we can go through is the ignition delay example, um, just going in order of complexity. Uh, ignition, ignition delay uses a batch reactor um, versus our 1D flame um, model. So we're going to import a couple of um, modules into this. So we're going to import NumPy. Oops, already off to a good start. Um, import NumPy as in P. You know, making typos just shows that even experienced people, it, everybody does it, doesn't matter how much experience you have. Exactly. Uh, so hopefully that gives everyone a boost of confidence. That you can be lid. a little more energized when you say that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, so we're going to import uh, matplotlib pyplot as plt so we can do some plotting. We're going to obviously import Cantera. Um, and then we're just going to print out Cantera version. That's interesting. Okay. All right. So we're using two point five. Um, this is standard procedure, I guess, for when you're constructing any of our, um, I guess, pre-built models um, as opposed to a custom-made model. Um, but we're going to create a phase object from an input file. We're going to set our initial and or boundary conditions. And then we're going to run the simulation. So for the batch reactor, um, we have, I think, four built-in reactor models. Um, so the one that we're going to be using in this example, I believe, is uh, just the ideal gas reactor. Um, so I guess I'll explain that more in the next couple cells. Um, but first, we're going to load and define our, um, our solution first. So we're going to call that gas, which is CT solution, which we saw in the morning examples. Um, and we're going to use, if you're using um, the uh, code repository that we showed everyone for this workshop, it should be in the 
data folder, and then in the sizer YAML file. So we're going to load that. We have a Kintera warning for a discontinuous NASA polynomial. Um, we also discussed that in the morning session, but if anybody wasn't there, um, it's basically telling us that one of our fits is probably not great for our enthalpy um, for the NASA polynomials. We're going to breeze past that for now, um, although obviously you don't want to have discontinuous NASA polynomials. We're going to specify our reactor temperature at 1,000 Kelvin. And then we're going to specify our reactor pressure. And that's going to be atmospheric pressure, so 101.325 Pascals. And then we're going to set our equivalence ratio for the fuel mix. And we're going to make that so that phi equals one the fuel is NC seven H six. So this is just a species identifier from the solution or the YAML file. Um, so that is not anything that's standardized within Cantera. That's going to change in every model that you have. Um, and then for the oxidizer, uh, we're going to say that that is oxygen and nitrogen. So specify O2 and we'll say that is one and in a ratio of one to three for nitrogen. Then we'll set our 3.76, sorry, because this is air. So then we're going to specify our gas um, temperature and pressure like we did in the morning examples. And we're just going to use what we defined up here. We got an equal sign. Okay. So then we have our gas and we've specified our mole fractions, our temperature and pressure. So then we have to select which uh, reactor class we want to use. Um, so there's four main ones in Cantera. We have the constant volume reactors and then the constant pressure and they're further broken up by which equation of state they use. So any equation of state, um, I think currently, um, I'm not sure which equations of state we have access to. We did mention we were working on Peng Robinson, um, but then the ideal gas reactors use the ideal gas uh, equation of state. So for this one, we're going to be using the ideal gas reactor. So we're gonna have a variable pressure and we're going to instantiate that create a reactor object. So that's just Cantera and then, oops, ideal gas reactor. And then we're gonna specify that the contents of that reactor are going to be the gas solution that we specified up here. So then um, it's going to seem, I guess, a little arbitrary because we only have one reactor. Um, but for solving the reactor, we have a reactor network object that we create. And the, I guess, more um, 
exemplary implementation of this is when you have multiple reactors and you've specified certain inlet and outlet conditions from the reactor, uh, you can solve them all simultaneously using this reactor network object. So for us in our instance, typing in the wrong window, we're simply going to say that our reactor network is comprised of one reactor, which is our reactor object. So then we're gonna use uh, this construct that's pretty convenient for recording the outlet data from our reactor, which is the solution array object. Um, and that's gonna give us basically the time history of mole fractions, temperature, pressure, et cetera, within our reactor. So we're gonna specify that as time history. While he's uh, typing that in, I'll just add a little bit of, of uh, more background on the um, solution array, which should be solution array and not reactor network. <laughs> I'm getting distracted. Um, so in, in some ways it's a lot, it, it's like a Python list or, or a NumPy array, um, but every element of the array has a uh, Cantera solution object associated with it. So each element of the array is able to store the complete state for the given um, conditions. And then uh, like with a Python list, you can actually append states to this uh, uh, array. So in this situation, we're doing just that, we're appending uh, extra variable, I guess, which will be T. So right now the solution array is empty. Um, and as we go through the so the integration process, we're going to add uh, consecutively add states into this time history to record it. All right. So we're starting out with an estimate. We're starting out with our time equal to zero. The estimate is basically an upper bound on how long we want to run our simulation. Um, we could just keep going indefinitely, but it gives us basically a stopping point. Um, T is less than our estimated mission delay time. Take a step. And then we will append the state of our reactor to the solution array. So time. dot thermo dot state t equals t. So setting our upper bound, setting time equal to zero, and then with each time step until we hit our ignition delay time, we'll step our reactor network forward, and then we'll append the thermo state so we have all of our data accessible for plotting and analysis later. All right, so now we have to select criteria for determining where our ignition delay occurs. So we're gonna say that our reference species is OH and we're going to get where we have a max OH uh, mass fraction within our system. So we're going to use our 
solution array. And then plug in our reference species, the mole fraction of the reference species, and then get the maximum for said mole fraction across our time history for that variable. And then we're going to print computed mission delay Oops, I missed an entire line. So now is equal to time history so tau is going to be the so we're getting the maximum value and then we're plugging in the actual value that we get for that maximum and getting the time so now we're printing out that time If I made any typos, yes, I did. <laughs> so this is giving our ignition delay as three or point zero three two four eight um, seconds. If I can so, just jump in real quick, real quick. Yeah, sure. If you can scroll back up to the um, integrator methods. Yeah. So we. Um, the uh, zero dimensional reactors use sundials and specifically the CVODES uh, package part of sundials to do the integration. <coughs> and CVODES is an adaptive time, step, time stepping, uh, I think it's a media algorithm, if that means anything to anyone. Um, and so there are three ways that you can advance the time in the simulation or, or basically perform the integration. The step method that we use here takes one. Um, time step. And the size of that is determined by CVODES. And CVODES will make the time sp step smaller when things are changing very rapidly. So for instance, during the ignition event, as the temperature starts to change very rapidly, the step size will get smaller. Um, but if the temperature is constant or the mole fraction of the species are constant, then uh, uh, CVODES can take bigger time steps. Um, the Jacobian matrix is numerical, although we are working on uh, adding uh, uh, analytical uh, Jacobian as well. Uh, we have a pull request open, I believe, for that. Um, so that take, so the step method takes one time step, and that gives you the highest resolution, right? That's the maximum number of points in the solution that, um, that can be returned uh, is by using the step method. On the other hand, if all you care about is uh, the results at particular time intervals, you can use the advanced method, uh, which you pass a time into the advanced method, and it will uh, uh, it will advance all the way up to that time. Uh, and then the last one there is advanced to steady state, which will take as many time steps as it needs until uh, uh, until it reaches steady state. Now this is still a time integration done to achieve steady state. And so there's some tolerances on what constitutes steady state that you can adjust. Um, Phil, I'm not sure how to uh, adjust the adaptive tolerances in CVODES um, because we rely on, on CVODES uh, itself. Yeah, we're using, this is pretty much a direct interface to CVODES. Uh, that's a great question. Let me um, let me go look at the at the documentation for that, and uh, Lele, and I'll uh, try and answer that. Uh, okay. So the uh, that was the last thing that I the second thing that I wanted to clarify was the argmax actually takes finds the index of the maximum in that array. So if you could scroll down a little bit, Chris. Yep. That's why we're that's why we're kind of doing this twice, or doing two lines here to get the actual ignition delay time. So this is um, that dot y returns an array. And if we did dot max, that would return us the maximum mass fraction. 
Um, but what we care about is when the maximum mass fraction happens or the index at which that happens, because the index in the mass fraction array is the same as the index in the time array. Okay, so that's why we use argmax there. So in this case, according to this definition, it's only gonna be one, uh, one stage of ignition, the overall ignition. Boying. Um, the temperature gradient, uh, because that's more coding, basically. <laughs> For the purposes of this example, we wanted to keep it simple. You can certainly define a gradient function. Um, I, I think probably what you'll find is that the gradient's a, a little bit noisy. And so it's actually a little bit challenging, even with the gradient, to define the um, ignition delay. Anyway, I'll let Chris keep going here. Yeah, I was just going to do the plot stuff um, while people were asking. Um, I guess so we could see something like the temperature gradient, but yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, all right. Um, So this is one of the features of matplotlib is that it um, allows limited uh, latex syntax to uh, format the uh, axes labels. Yeah, so you can do subscripts and superscripts and cool stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this is basically plotting our um, OH mass fraction versus time. You can see where we and get the max um, from that plot. Uh, okay, so you can I also guess, see the adaptive step sizes on there as well. In the end of the simulation, there it takes long step and then an even longer step. So. Actually, can I? I'm not sure if this lets me zoom in. I haven't used it. Does if you click the square next to the pair of arrows? Yeah. I guess that's not really showing us anything else different, but yeah, you you really have to zoom in quite a lot to see. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Um, okay, so the next piece of this um, is we're going to be evaluating the negative temperature coefficient. Um, and sorry, so, Chris, can you show the code for the plot again? Sure. Yeah. All set. Um, should I leave it up? Okay, great. Okay, so the next, I guess, benchmark we're going to be looking at is the negative temperature coefficient. Um, again, I'm not a combustion scientist, so some of this is a little foreign to me, but, um, you know, intuitively, as your temperature increases, you'd think it would ignite faster under certain conditions you'll see the opposite behavior, which is referred to as uh, NTC behavior. So another way to validate, or I guess another important benchmark for your combustion mechanism is whether or not you can replicate this kind of behavior. Um, 
So we're going to be visualizing the ignition delay for a number of different, I guess, equivalence ratios. Um, so uh, NTC behavior for an heptane occurs between 600 to 800. Um, so we need to do an integration of this over a wide range of temperatures. We're going to construct a NumPy structure to house our temperature ranges. So we're going to do NP for NumPy H stack. Um, and then we're going to do a NumPy range. It's going to be 1800 thousand decrement by 100 and then specify a second range. And that's going to be 1,000, 75, and then decrement by 25. Align, align. I think I have a missing one. Yes. So like in the other example, um, we're going to define some estimated times for this since we have a bunch of them. Um, we're going to do this by basically cutting up our temperature ranges. So let's do estimated Oh, Jesus. Um, That is going to be a construct or a structure of all ones to start. And then we're going to basically take each piece of that. So for following ranges, and I think it says in the note, but this is empirical. Um, so it's not guess obvious offhand um, to okay. so we've specified these like in the other one as our estimates for our ignition delay time um, I think maybe because I'm a slow typer, um, we'll take time to discuss the cell, but I'm going to start doing a little bit of copying and pasting since we have two examples to get through. Um, and I don't want y'all to have to suffer through uh, watching me type all this out painstakingly. Um, so We're going to set up another solution array. Um, this is maybe a little more advanced than the last one. Um, so we're specifying a shape for this solution array. So again, we're specifying the um, solution that we're going to be um, taking our properties from. But then we're using this shape argument to specify that it's going to have the dimensions of this T um, array. I think maybe Brian, I'm not as familiar with solution array. So maybe um, if you wouldn't mind explaining a little bit more what's going on here, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in this case, we're in, in the last case, we started with an empty solution array and we 
um, uh, filled it by appending new rows uh, of data to it. In this case, we are uh, starting with um, some existing data and uh, uh, by giving it the shape of the temperature, um, the temp array of temperatures that we had. So we'll have uh, each row will be um, a different temperature in that, uh, in that array. And so the neat thing here is that we can set the whole array uh, to have particular conditions all in two lines that look a lot like the lines that you would use for a normal um, solution instead of a whole array of solutions here. So since, um, so Cantera is smart enough in the background, since the uh, solution array has the same shape as the temperature array, when you set the temperature in this way by passing in that array, capital T, uh, on the third line to set the temperature, Cantera is smart enough to assign each row to be one of those values from that array. Excellent. Okay. So then similar to the last example, we're setting our, let's see, our equivalence ratio and then our ignition delays, TP, our ignition delays are then going to be specified with our capital T and then reactor pressure. Um, so then we have this block, which again, I'm going to cheat a little bit here for the sake of time. So we're going to go through each of our basically trials that we've specified. We're going to specify the temperature, pressure, and the mole fractions for our gas solution object. We're going to create our reactor, so an ideal gas reactor, put it into a reactor network, and then initialize two empty lists that we're going to fill as we go along. So they're going to be the reference species history and then the time history. And then we'll initialize T at zero. And so we're going to run next for each state that we've specified we're going to run um, the same it's essentially the same code that we did above so while we're below this estimated ignition delay time we're going to step our reactor network we're going to append our time to our time history so we're going to plot that later and you can see what that looks like and then we're also going to append the reference species um, guess that's the mole fraction of the OH that we're using there. Yeah, that's okay. Right. So then, uh, I'm just gonna copy that. So this is the same calculation as before. Uh, the only thing we have to do differently is um, convert those lists into NumPy arrays because the argmax uh, function is only defined for the uh, for NumPy arrays. It's not defined for regular lists. But then once we get that index of the maximum, then we can fill it in, or then we can get the time at that index and call that our ignition delay for this temperature. So this code is looping through that array of temperatures that we created earlier um, and running the same closed um, uh, batch simulation reactor or batch reactor simulation for each one. 
and uh, uh, calculating the ignition delay and, and is printing it out here. And it's also storing that ignition delay in the uh, ignition delay solution array that we created before. Okay, so that should just take another second to finish. Looks like we just did. And so now we'll uh, create an Arrhenius plot. Um, so ideally, the uh, the ignition delay is is um, uh, inversely proportional to the log of the temperature. Uh, and so, if we the Arrhenius plot is the typical method of uh, of showing this. Um, and so, in this case, we're going to plot the inverse temperature on the x-axis on the bottom, and then the actual temperature on the top axis. And we can see that the uh, this particular mechanism, which happens to be one of the Livermore mechanisms, although it's quite old now, um, and we're using it because it's a good sample, it's, it's a reasonable size and it runs in a reasonable amount of time. Um, uh, you, we can see that it does reproduce the NTC region here for, uh, for N-heptane, as, as we expect. So the, the purpose here with this example was, again, to emphasize the, those three steps to any Cantera simulation, and then also how we can use the... Uh, uh, um, a solution array to, to our benefit to store this, this kind of information as well. Uh, Amir, that's totally possible. Um, we actually have a different example that we're not going to show today to do the RCM experiments with a volume history. Um, that's in the 2019 folder. If you go to NCM 2019 folder, it's in there. Uh, it's like zero D velocity or something like that. Yeah, I guess. Is that? Uh, in the 2019, if you go up one more, yeah. And then, yeah, zero D velocity. I won't run through this whole thing, but it exists on that repository mm -hmm. that you should all be able to access. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you have any questions about uh, specific, specific problems there, uh, feel free to post it on the Kintera Google group and we'll be happy to help. Okay. Okay. So our second um, example is uh, well. Actually, let's let's pause for questions on that ignition. Other questions on that ignition delay example. Okay. If you do have some, throw them in the chat, and and we'll get to them as as quick as we can. Phil, sorry, Phil. I just saw you lean forward. Did you have a question? Good. Okay. All right. Then let's go on to the flame speeds. And I guess Dan, you're probably going to take those. Uh, yeah, I can um, type it up. Um, well, I, Chris is gonna. Yeah, I can I can type up the code if someone else wants to to talk through it because yeah, I'm not super familiar with um, with this part of Cantera. Sure. Uh, well, and uh, uh, um, yeah, why why don't I just do it then? So I'll share my screen. That'll be okay. Easier. Uh, just. Uh... This off. To get the answer to your question, Lilith, I had to look in the source code to actually find that answer. Um, okay, so um, you're building a model, you're, you're validating a kinetic model and you in, for combustion and you want to publish it. Uh, you're gonna have to do ignition delays. You're gonna have to do um, unstrained laminar flame speeds. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna, the code for the, uh, freely propagating adiabatic 1D flame, we're going to show in this example. Um, very simply, it, it's a one-dimensional coordinate system. So we, we assume that the uh, products, uh, sorry, the, the reactants are on the left and the products are on the right. Uh, the flame is represented by a, um, uh, a region in the middle of the domain. And the uh, coordinate system is fixed to the flame such that the incoming velocity, uh, which causes the flame to be stable in the domain, is equal to the flame velocity, right? Just, it's just a, a, a change of your reference frame. Um, the, uh, so that's the unburned uh, flame speed, SU. Um, okay, so uh, I want to sound, actually I want to sound like a broken record here, there's three steps to this, just like with everything else. Um, 
the three steps are load the uh, phase, uh, set up the simulation, set up the boundary air flow conditions, and then run the simulation. So the first thing we got to do here is import um, Intera. And there we go. So that um, has uh, Under, double sorry. underscores in it, uh, two underscores. In Python, that's usually called a dunder variable. Uh, dunder Brian, meaning quick, double underscore. I don't know if you're sharing your screen. I think I'm still sharing, sorry. <laughs> oh. Did you stop? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You can see my screen now? I can see yours, yeah. OK, perfect. Yeah, so there's two underscores there. So just um, that's a, a Python convention that uh, basically means um, don't rely on this variable continuing to exist, or it's not usually something that um, users are going to use for a, 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 something useful. That was a lot of users. OK. Um, all right, so we're going to use um, the GRI 30 uh, mechanism in this example. Again, for simplicity, uh, if we were doing um, actual con comparisons to experiments, we would um, want to use a more modern model. But uh, for the sake of having something that comes with Cantera and also something that move, that runs relatively fast, um, we can uh, we'll use the the GRI 30. So we need to um, create this uh, uh, mixture or the solution, I suppose, um, with these species. And this by default is going to load the uh, a transport model as a mixture average and load all of the 325 reactions from that um, file. And we will set the initial conditions as well uh, for the, uh, for the um, inlet side of the flame, okay? And um, Cantera works in all SI units, always in SI units, except for uh, kilomoles instead of moles. So if you get out like the energy properties on a molar basis, then they are going to be uh, per kilomole instead of per mole. Um, OK, and one of the neat things about Cantera is that we're actually going to, instead of um, giving it a grid ex explicitly, we're going to tell it a, a domain width. Oops, uh, and um, yeah, so I, that way uh, Cantera can figure out the appropriate grid and refine it as it needs to. Okay. So gas set equivalence ratio. We're just gonna do uh, a stoichiometric methane uh, and air flame. And the temperature and pressure are gonna be T0 and T0. So this is uh, step one and step two from our uh, procedure up there. The third step here is um, actually even a little bit easier than the ignition delay example, uh, because we have a built-in um, free flame model. We have actually uh, uh, a number of uh, one-dimensional flow domains that you can um, stick together to create your own situation. Uh, if you want, um, we have inlets and outlets, and you can do a stagnation flow against the surface. Um, that surface could have catalytic behavior. Uh, we have an example, I think, that does um, uh, diamond uh, CVD, uh, continuous vapor deposition, to create a thin film of diamond um, on a surface. So uh, this can handle multiphase as well. Um, and uh, those examples are on, on our website. Um, okay, so we're gonna create an instance of this free flame class. We're gonna call it with the variable name flame. And we're gonna assign it this width. And so we chose our initial width of two centimeters here, uh, 0 0.02 meters. And um, let's see. Okay, so uh, the any uh, one dimensional model here, is going to have to account for um, species transport by diffusion, okay? And when you want to calculate that, you need to, to have a binary diffusion coefficient for each species. 
There's a couple of different assumptions that you can make about how that transport is happening. The most common ones are the mixture average um, with the mix keyword. Uh, the other one would be multi for multi-component diffusion. Multi-component diffusion is going to be more accurate, but it also takes a lot longer to reach the solution. So what we typically recommend is to um, first solve using the mixture average transport and then change the flame over to be using multi-component um, uh, multi -component transport. And you can do all that with the same uh, variable here. You don't need to restart the solution. It'll always start from the same or from the last uh, good solution that it had. Uh, okay. So we're just going to say that the flame transport model is mixture average for now, right? Because we're only uh, initially solving this. And then we're going to um, uh, go from there. Uh, uh oh, what happened to my Zoom? Oh, there you all are. That was weird. That cut out, cut out for a second or something. I don't know. Um, okay. So um, the other thing that Kintera does automatically is it will uh, refine the grid, which is uh, a feature that you that you really need in this kind of a solver. So in this one-dimensional domain, the governing equations are discretized onto the grid. Um, the grid is gonna have that width that we specified of, of two centimeters. And Cantera will automatically add grid points um, based on uh, three criteria, and it can actually remove grid points based on a fourth criteria. So um, there the three criteria to add grid points are called ratio, slope, and curve. Um, the ratio, limits the maximum distance between two grid points. So if two grid points are, are too far apart from each other, or if consecutive grid points are too far apart relative to this ratio, uh, then a grid point will be added. Um, if the uh, slope of the solution variable, of a solution variable or the um, curvature of a solution variable exceeds the tolerance that we give here, then um, a grid point will be added in that location as well to resolve the solution. So we're going to set the refine criteria. Uh, um, these are pretty good values. Um, this is another case where you can um, set somewhat higher values in your initial tries at a solution, which is particularly effective with very large mechanisms, and um, um, re successively reduce the, the uh, criteria here uh, in, in subsequent solves. Okay. Oh, sorry, I, I totally missed that chat a message about the first code line. Um, the, the, we do actually, Chris, sorry, we do have a pull request open right now to add a separate interface in the Python interface that will allow you to work in different units. Um, and it depends on your field, what the normal units for concentration are. Uh, but yeah, one choice is the, the SI units. Um, and that's what's used internally in Kintera. In the conversion process from the Kempkin format, um, we check for unit specifications in there, and then the units of the input foil can, file can be specified in the input file, as Chris said. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Okay. All right. Okay, so we set the uh, refine criteria. And then the last bit here is to uh, solve. Uh, so um, Cantera Solver provides varying levels of output uh, to the screen that you can use to monitor the, the solution. Um, if you're pretty sure the solution is gonna work, setting log, the log level to be a value of zero or uh, one, is, is fine. Zero means no output. One means just a minimal output to track the progress. If um, you have cases that are failing, you can increase the value of log level all the way up to a maximum of eight, and you can go higher, but it doesn't add anything. And uh, you'll get more and more output, including the residuals and the Jacobian and, and a, a lot of information that, that um, you don't really care about when things are working. Okay, so we're going to set flame.solve here. 
uh, to call the solver, we're going to set the log level to one so that you can see it, uh, at least for this first time. And then the other thing that we're going to specify here is auto equals true. And um, this auto uh, keyword argument here, this auto argument to the function uh, triggers and uh, triggers a, a routine in Cantero that um, uh, does its best to uh, try a bunch of different things that's the typical procedure for solving a, a flame. Um, so if you've ever worked with this before, then you'll know that, that um, if you try and solve a flame, uh, uh, one of the steps that you can, and it doesn't work, one of the steps that you can take is to use a coarser grid, uh, or sometimes uh, more grid points can help. Um, sometimes uh, solving the simulation uh, with a fixed temperature profile, and um, for a first case, ignoring the uh, ignoring the um, energy equation to produce an initial solution, and then turning the energy equation back on can help. Um, uh, sometimes, um, uh, yeah. But anyways, uh, oh, if um, you set a multi-component or mixture average transport initially, uh, and you use the auto solver, Cantera will automatically turn whatever setting you have to mixture average, solve it, and then switch back to multi-component transport and solve it again um, because it wants to start, or it's better to start with the mixture average, right? So this auto solver takes care of what in Kimkin might be a bunch of continuation runs, right? Which you might set up as a bunch of continuation. Um, Michael, the, the transport model in, in the YAML file only sets the um, initial uh, case, the initial value, and you can adjust it after that after the fact. So it's like a default. Whatever's in the YAML file is a default. Default. Okay. So let me run this here. And um, so this is trying to solve, it's going to do the uh, try a Newton solution of the steady state problem. If it doesn't work, it takes some time steps and goes back and forth. Okay, here you see it says um, we solved on this nine point grid. And this is pretty interesting because um, we set the initial width as two centimeters. And um, Cantera has a check in the auto solver to make sure that the boundary conditions are satisfied. And if they're not, then it will increase the width automatically. Uh, so here the width has been increased to four centimeters. And you can also see how it's refining the grid in the flame. Um, it's inserting grid points at nearly every point to resolve all of the, the species profiles, the temperature and the velocity, okay? It will not reduce the width if it's too large because there's not really such a thing as too large. Um, I mean, at, at some point it will, uh, uh, um, you'll have numerical problems, but that's not, uh, yeah, that's much harder to deal with automatically. Okay, so again, it's gonna try on this refined grid now. Um, uh, well, it's based on the gradients, not the derivative of the gradients. Yeah. I believe that was introduced in either 2.4 or 2.5. I, I don't remember which, which version, okay. Okay, so then we solve here on the 16 point grid, it works. And once you get a pretty good solution, the refinement process usually goes pretty well, um, as long as the flame is pretty well behaved. And so we're just gonna keep adding grid points in here until uh, uh, until all our refinement criteria are satisfied, we end up with 151 grid points uh, in this solution. Okay. I'm almost out of time here. So uh, let me just show a couple of more things here. So to get the flame speed, um, we want to uh, I get the, um, velocity component, and uh, that's gonna be at the uh, initial grid point, which is zero. Everything in Python is zero-based indexing, and we'll multiply it by 100 and, and print it out. And then we can also get statistics about the different states that the solver went through. So initially it had 11 uh, grid points, and it took 60 time steps and called these. And so this is useful if you wanna see where your uh, solver is spending a lot of time, right? And, we expect that it would be mostly in the um, initial case and not so much uh, after that. Okay, um, we can do some plotting. I'll just tell you that the uh, that that the boundary conditions are satisfied. Um, we have 
uh, built-in uh, sensitivity analysis, which is an adjoint sensitivity analysis of the um, the uh, flame speed to the kinetic parameters, to the A factor in particular of all the reactions. And so that method is called uh, get flame speed reaction sensitivities. Um, well, if there's auto ignition ahead of the flame, then there is, uh, uh, then our, our, our boundary conditions aren't satisfied, right? Our assumptions in this model are no longer satisfied. And so you have to handle that differently at least a little bit differently. Okay, so we can print out the 20 most sensitive reactions. Um, yeah, auto ignition at high temperature and pressure is, is a, a uh, or yeah, flame speeds for that case. I mean, that's not a very well-defined problem in general, yeah. Uh, Boyang, there is an option to account for um, radiation in the flames. Um, although I won't show it here, you can look. I believe we have an example that shows it. So we can get, as we expect, it's the hydrogen chemistry in the initial stages of the uh, the flame decomp or the methane decomposition. Okay. The last thing we can do, as I said before, is um, reuse previous solutions here to to uh, 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 reuse previous solutions to do um, multiple flames and parameter sweep. Since it's three o'clock now and, and we're going to be moving on to the next sessions, um, I won't cover this, but uh, you don't need to start with a brand new flame object every time. You can do effectively a continuation um, and you, you just need to add the prune case, the prune keyword to the refine criteria, which will end up removing grid points when it, um, when it needs to. And the other thing to note is the second time you use a flame object to solve, don't set auto equals true, okay? Because you don't know, you no longer need the auto solver because you already have a, a pretty well refined grid, which is a pretty close to the solution that you're looking for if you only change one, uh, one, one or uh, one or two of the variables. Um, yes, it does handle plasma chemistry. Uh, we have ion flames. Yeah, we can handle ion and flame, ions and flames and. Um, Actually, we might have a pull request for plasma chemistry. I'm not sure if that feature has been completed yet. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you everybody. Um, thank you for being here for this session. Uh, I'm going to go hop into a different session now. I'm going to go hop into the uh, contributing to Cantera session, and uh, but I and and uh, I think uh, Ray Speth and a few other people. I think Chris is actually going to stick around and and do the PSR and the PFR examples. So if you're sticking around for those, um, well, it's going to be in a different room, a different uh, um, Zoom meeting room because we had to to change up our links, but. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, everybody, and I hope to see you again soon. Stop sharing that. All right, this is actually going to end the meeting, so. Oh, I guess I can just leave it. All right.